Welcome everybody to our weekly contact service. Today, many of you will recognise the background of our filming. Yes, we're back in church. A committee are looking at ways how we can reopen our beloved church in a safe and meaningful way. We aim to send out a short contact leaflet seeking new views about reopening of our beloved church for Sunday worship. They will be with you just as soon as possible. And we will ask you please do study them and get back to us before the end of July. You may recall our service the 28th of June when we heard the desperate plight of our friends in Mathia Church, Kenya. Well, last weekend, Anne Dunbar received an email update. So here is Anne to share with us the latest news from Mathia. Hello everyone. Well, from the 1st of July, we received photos of Mathia elders along with Reverend Daniel Mushara, receiving the new laptop gifted by a Max West member. Also, photos from people who received some help for food. Grateful thanks from them to all who are in the World Church team and others for standing with them in such difficult times. Giving support as God has such a purpose for our togetherness, they say. The laptop has been a blessing to many people in church and community. Also for students who don't have their own. And on the 7th of July, I viewed a broadcast from the Kenyan Education Department, a message to parents with children at home, instructing all the rules that we have to stay safe. To those in the countryside with small farms, parents should teach children how to cultivate Primary and secondary school exams are cancelled, which means that no certificates will be granted for those moving up. They announced the school calendar for 2020 is lost. Basic instructions were given to reopen in January 2021, only if COVID-19 has been clear for 14 days. The university students, it is suggested with them they may return in September this year. According to John, this is ridiculous, as the COVID level is rising every week. And the 10th of July, quoting John, receive Christian greetings on behalf of our church and community. We have appreciated with great humility the help that you have given us. Surely, shown the true Christian love. Jesus talked of this when he said about somebody who was hungry and was given food. Surely that is what you have done to many people, even those you do not know. As I am writing today, we have a case in our parish where one of our members, who is not married but has four children, she was about to take her life for having nothing to give her kids. Luckily, this was noted by our reverend and quick action was taken. Concerning the food situation, it seems as this is not going to recover soon. You are aware of what happened from last year with locusts destroying crops and floods doing the same, followed by COVID-19. Things are not going good. Reopening the churches, John has been tasked to look into ways to do this. People over 65 will not be allowed to go to church, or children under 14. However, this is a suggestion. It is not yet confirmed, he says. Thank you very much, Anne, and it is reassuring to know God is indeed at work amongst his people in Matthew. To begin our service today, let me read a psalm of praise. Psalm 145, verses 1 to 9 and verse 21, read from the message. I lift you high in praise, my God, O my King, and I bless your name into eternity. I bless you every day and keep it up from now to eternity. God is magnificent. He can never be praised enough. There are no boundaries to his greatness. Generation after generation stands in awe of your work. Each one tells stories of your mighty acts. Your beauty and splendour have everyone talking. 
I compose songs on your wonders. Your marvellous doings are headline news. I could write a book full of the details of your greatness. The fame of your goodness spreads across the country. Your righteousness on everyone's lips. God is all mercy and grace. Not quick to anger, is rich in love. God is good to one and all. Everything he does is suffused with grace. My mouth is filled with God's praise. Let everything living bless him. Bless his holy name from now to eternity. Amen. Let us pray. Loving and faithful shepherd, father of all humankind, today we come before you in our own homes with praise and thanksgiving upon our lips. Lord, now that we have freedom to move around and we are so much more aware of the beauty of our surroundings, aware also of the joy of human friendship and love, and aware of the blessings of family life and the pleasures of everyday living in this fair world. Lord of all creation, today as we worship you, we acknowledge your dependence upon you, acknowledge our need for each other, and acknowledge too our faults and our feelings. So we dare to ask for your forgiveness. Forgive us when we have lost courage. Forgive us when we have lost hope. Forgive us the times when we have our faith has become lukewarm. Forgive us when we have been negative about the future of Christ Church. Forgive us when we have judged others harshly and forgot to look at ourselves. Above all, during these past months of lockdown, forgive us when we did not carry our worries and concerns to you in prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, in our moments of silence, we pray that you'll act compassionately towards us. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy upon us. Merciful Lord of yesterday, today and tomorrow, thank you for warming us with your loving embrace. Thank you for watering us with your forgiveness. And thank you for nurturing us with renewed hope and allowing us to grow our faith stronger through the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. All these prayers we are offered now in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, the one who is both sower and seed. In his name we pray together by saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today, we begin a series of services reflecting upon St. Paul's letter to the Romans. This letter has been called a Christian Manifesto. Indeed, it was this very book that Martin Luther saw the beginnings of his 95-point thesis to the door of Castle Church in Wittenberg, Germany, in 1517, and thus began the Reformation of the Church. The theme of this letter can be summarised in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. God's way of putting people right shows up in the acts of faith, confirming that Scripture has said all along the person in right standing before God by trusting him really lives. Over the next few weeks, our readings will be taken from Romans and read from the message by Eugene Peterson. So let us hear our reading today, Romans chapter 1, verses 1 to 7 and verses 13 to 17, and will be read today by Patricia Jardin. I, Paul, am a devoted slave of Jesus Christ on assignment, authorised as an apostle to proclaim God's words and acts. I write this letter to all the believers in Rome, God's friends. The sacred writings contain preliminary reports by the prophets on God's son. His descent from David roots him in history. His unique identity as son of God was shown by the spirit when Jesus was raised from the dead, setting him apart as the Messiah, our master. Through him, we received both the generous gift of his life and the urgent task of passing it on to others who receive it by entering into obedient trust in Jesus. You are who you are through this gift and call of Jesus Christ. And I greet you now with all the generosity of God, 
our Father and our Master Jesus, the Messiah. Please don't misinterpret my failure to visit you, friends. You have no idea how many times I've made plans for Rome. I've been determined to get some personal enjoyment out of God's work among you, as I have in so many other non-Jewish towns and communities. But something has always come up and prevented it. Everyone I meet, it matters little whether they're mannered or rude, smart or simple, deepens my sense of interdependence and obligation. And that's why I can't wait to get to you in Rome, preaching this wonderful news of God. It's news I'm most proud to proclaim, this extraordinary message of God's powerful plan to rescue everyone who trusts him, starting with Jews and then right on to everyone else. God's way of putting people right shows up in the acts of faith, confirming what scripture has said all along. The person in right standing before God, by trusting him, really lives. Thank you very much indeed, Patricia. Let's sing together the hymn CH4645, I'm not ashamed to own my love. Romans is a very different letter from St Paul's other letters, in that this letter was written to a church which Paul neither had begun nor visited. Paul wrote this letter from Corinth around AD 57-58. In his other letters, Paul is dealing with different situations which have arisen and required to be corrected or answered. But in Romans, St Paul is setting out his own theology and how, as Christians, we should live our life, which... Paul saw a salvation has been made possible for us through God's Son, Jesus Christ. We must first understand the message of the Gospel so we will know how we can be saved. Listen again to verse 1. I, Paul, am a devoted slave of Jesus Christ on assignment, authorised as an apostle to proclaim God's words and in Acts, I write this letter to all the believers in Rome God's friends. Faith is a central word in the Gospels and indeed throughout the New Testament. In fact, Jesus used the word faith often. Three times Jesus healed people and said, your faith has healed you. Have you still no faith? Jesus asked the disciples after calming the storm. He also told his disciples, if you have faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this tree, be uprooted and cast it into the sea, and it would obey you. To a gentle woman in Syria, who refused to stop begging for a child's healing, even after being insulted, Woman, you have great faith. May it be done as you believed. And so on. Faith is so central to the gospel message. John Payton, 
a local native missionary born in Kirkmahoe in 1824, trained in medicine and theology in Glasgow, married and then went out to the South Sea Islands. He learnt their language and began to translate the New Testament into their language. He discovered that the natives had no word for trust or faith. One day, a native who had been working hard came into the missionary's house, flopped himself into a large, comfortable chair and said in his own language, it's good to rest my whole weight on this chair. This became a revelation to Peyton. That's it, he said. I'll translate faith as resting one's whole weight on God. When we truly believe in God, the way that Paul speaks about, we are indeed resting our whole weight on him. Listen again to verse 17. The person in right standing before God by trusting him really lives. True biblical faith is casting oneself wholly on the Lord Jesus Christ as your only hope for salvation. Faith is trusting and believing in what Jesus did on the cross. It's all you need. It is not something we can buy or earn. Jude, in his letter, said this in verses 20 and 21. But you, dear friends, be careful to build yourselves up in the most holy faith by praying in the Holy Spirit, staying right at the centre of God's love, keeping your arms open and outstretched, ready for the mercy of our Master, Jesus Christ. This is the unending life, the real life, and that is free for you today. Trust in God and do the right. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, our loving Heavenly Father, we come once again before you with prayers of thanksgiving and petition on our lips. Lord, we thank you for our families and friends. Especially we thank you for those who helped us through these past few months of trial. Lord, we thank you also for the Christian family of Maxwellton West Church for its continuation these past months of weekly services, reaching out to your people all over the world. We thank you for all who have participated in these services, sharing their heavenly gifts to bring us so much comfort, joy and hope. Lord, we pray for our interim minister, Reverend Sally, who has continued to work hard for us behind scenes these past months. As we look forward to new normal and returning to worship in our church. Help each one of us to have courage to overcome our fears and anxieties about COVID-19. Grant to each one of us your peace, which is beyond our understanding, and encourage us to come together in our own beloved church building to worship you in strength once again. Lord, also hear our prayers for our Christian friends in Mathia, Kenya. We have been encouraged to help them, and we know that our gifts have been a blessing to many. So we pray for the people of Mathia. Lord, pour out your blessings upon them. Bless Reverend Daniel and his elders as they strive to reach out with your love to help the most vulnerable of the people. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you will offer them the bread and water of life so that they may be fed inwardly by the Holy Spirit and continue to grow stronger in faith. Help each one of us to strengthen and deepen the roots of our faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour, who died for us and rose again so that we might be assured of eternal life. These prayers we offer and ask through the precious name of our risen Lord and Master Jesus Christ, who reigns with you and the Holy Spirit as one God, now and forevermore. Amen. Titus says this, Christ gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works and the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>